serving now in the Diocese of Fort Worth. I'm at St. Vincent's, one of the staff, the priests and staff at the cathedral. I'm so delighted to be here during this Lenten season as we prepare ourselves pretty much for Easter. As we always go through these seasons, somehow every so often they become so regular and common and uh, sometimes we just go through them without too much seriousness. But it's always glorious to see a people who are walking their Easter walk, preparing themselves for Easter. It's a holy walk with our Lord and in our Lord's name, preparing ourselves for Easter. Lent is one of those seasons where we go back to the drawing board and we not think about others, we don't think about anybody else but we think about ourselves, not in a selfish way, but as a way of finding what is making me miss the mark. What do I miss in my relationship with God? Where do I go wrong as I try to serve a loving and living God? And as we walk, we walk, we examine ourselves, we read scriptures, we interact with our God through devotions that by the time we come to Easter, we have established where we have been going wrong, we have corrected where we were going wrong, and we are ready to celebrate Easter with Him and join in that hallelujah with the angels and archangels and the host of heaven and on earth in celebrating our being cleansed and made whole again. As we started Easter four Sundays ago, we were reminded of the same thing that our Lord Jesus Christ went through. That after he had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and went out and was ready for ministry, the first encounter was face to face with the devil. And we saw that the devil, as we were reading the scriptures, we realized that we had read it many times that actually realize that the devil comes to us in those moments when we are very prone, when we are temptable, when something would give him a crutch. The crutch for our Lord Jesus Christ was hunger, and so the devil knew that the Lord is hungry, so that was the prone moment for the devil to say, aha, the aha moment for the devil, I'll crutch him. And those moments also come to us. When the devil comes to you in that moment of saying, aha, whether it is through death of a loved one, whether it's through loss of a job, whether it is through divorce and all these things we go through, the devil uses that moment, aha, you always claim to love God. Look at what God has done to you. And it requires a courageous person, just like our Lord, to be able to decipher what the devil is saying and what God is saying. Because one of the things we learned again as we were reading that gospel which started us off on the first Sunday, we saw that actually the devil reads scripture. Because every time the devil was caught in scripture, but Jesus was strong enough to know where some quotation is not rightly placed. So each, each time the devil quoted scripture, the Lord also quoted, countered with a more meaningful and powerful scripture. But today, we are following in that season, but, but looking at the three aspects that our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted. Our Lord was tempted in three areas, and these three areas are also what we proclaim in our baptism of vows. Those of you who are baptized using the liturgy of the 1928 prayer book, immediately realized the three areas they, they, they told us to fight against. Because when our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted, first of all, it was about hunger. 
things of the flesh. And the devil saw that Jesus was hungry and said, turn these stones into bread and eat the needs of the body. The second area of Jesus Christ was tempted are the things of the world. When the devil took him and said, I'll give you all the things. And then the devil promised to give and then our Lord Jesus Christ said, Scripture says. And then finally the devil turns that if you, if you are the son of God, worship me. And then when the devil realized that our Lord Jesus Christ was not ready to worship our Lord Jesus Christ, get away from me, Satan. So he tempted the, the Lord in three areas, the flesh, the world, and the devil himself. And these are the areas where when we're getting baptized, we were told to fight, go and become soldiers in Christ's army, to fight the flesh, the devil, and the world. And when we come to Lent, these are the three main areas we are supposed As soldiers in Christ's army, the devil approaches us in those three areas to take us away from God, to take us away from our Lord Jesus Christ. The devil, the flesh, and the world. If you come to examine yourself and you examine all the problems of the world, you realize that they come in those three forms. They come in the people who are so gravitated towards grabbing things from the world. The people who are so much bent into serving their own body's needs. And also the people who are literally just devil worshippers. The three areas are where we are supposed to fight. This land takes us to the ground board to say, where in those three areas? You fail to meet the man. But as we find where we fail to meet the man, we are required not to lose hope. We are required not just to give up. It's like I've tried all my life, I've been faithful, but this thing has overwhelmed me. I'll never get out of this bodily need, I'll never get out of this worldly craving. I'll never get out of just seeing the devil as another God in my life. Now, when such things come, and you feel overwhelmed, and you feel always tempted, and you have been immersed and involved in so many things of the world, then we read the gospel today. Another common scripture we all know about the prodigal son. How many times have we read it? So many times. But one of the things we realize when we read, as a young child reading that story, for the longest time in my life, reading that story, I gave credit to the older son. And I always hated or disliked this child who, liked, who left. But at some point it came to my senses and I said, wait a minute, this child is at home. He never left, but he never realized what belongs to him. Actually, he was not one with the father because he was even timid of touching anything in his father's household. But then the son who left went to try out his life wasted it, did everything crazy people do in the world. He was tempted by things of the world. Give me a portion of what belongs to me. And he went and squandered it. Hanged out with prostitutes, did all the things of the world, the devil and the flesh. But then scripture says when he came to his senses, if you forget everything I'm saying this morning, I want you to remember those words that in Lent we come to our senses. Scripture says that when the son came to his senses, he said, wait a minute, 
I'll arise and go to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and earth and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your employees, but I want to come home. He knew that father's home was better than any other home. He came to his senses. And when he came to his senses, he realized that there was nothing in the world, nothing in the world that would give him comfort, joy, and peace. Like being in the father's presence, in the father's house. Not only did he come to his senses, but he walked. He walked a distance. Many of us will come to our senses, think about it and say, well, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Maybe I'll do it the next year. Where is the Lord making you come to send to your sense with your Eve, with your sin, with something you do with, with a ministry that you have always wanted to do in the church? When you come to your senses, then you have to take action. He took action. He walked and walked and walked and walked. And before long, he was at the father's house, back in the household of God, of his father. And when he got there, that was step number two. He came to his senses. He took action. He came to his senses. He took action. And now after taking action, he does the third thing. Confess. He utters out those words to his father. I have sinned. <coughs> I have come. I'm no longer worthy. Those are the three things we are supposed to do every Sunday when we come to church. We come to our senses at home that I need another dose of holiness. Then you take the second action, you come to church. And when you get here, you utter the words of confession, of forgiveness. Let it take, takes us back the reality that actually God is a loving God, just like he did to the prodigal son. <coughs> he embraces us back into his fellowship. He accepts us back as one with him. And there is always celebration for our return. There is no sin too great for God to forgive. There is no evil thing we do too great, too burdensome for, for God to forgive. Even a murderer who comes to his senses will be forgiven by God. How about us? Who have never gone that far. And having been forgiven and embraced and received by God, then we become one with Him. We join the banquet, we join the celebration, and it's always glorious. But the fourth aspect of the celebration is that the brother who was at home and didn't know what belongs to him comes back home and he doesn't <coughs> join the party because he never belonged from the beginning. Every so often even in church, there are some people who see a sinner come to church and they say, I'll never go to church because it received this kind of sinners. I never go there because that man was too bad to be received back in church. If you're the elder brother, you feel like that. If you are part of the Father's fellowship, you join in the party. There's always celebration in heaven and on earth for one sinner who repents. Lent takes us to the drawing board. Lent opens us to the reality of the things around us. Lent causes us to come to our senses with the things that are bothering us, where we are weak, where we are slothful, where we are lazy. And when we come to our senses, we don't just stop there. Like the prodigal son, we take a step in the right direction to go back to the Father. And when we get to the Father, we utter the words 
of genuine repentance. The son came back home whole. He came back home ready to stay. Let us not be partially in church, but also partially in the world. We take the whole state in the right direction. And today's lessons are assuring us that there is celebration in heaven. There is celebration among God's people for one great sinner who receives forgiveness from God. That's why Paul is appealing to us in the first lesson. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. How do we reconcile ourselves to God? By coming face to face with the three aspects I started with. Those which confronted our Lord. They confront us on a daily basis. Be reconciled to God. Don't be gravitating towards worldly things. Don't be gravitating towards flesh needs. Don't gravitate towards devil worship and all acts of worship that are not worthy of God. Be reconciled to God. Come back to God's house. Celebrate with him. For repent of your sins. Forgiveness will be yours. And so this Sunday, may we be like the prodigal son. Walk back to God and say, I have sinned. I have sinned. I'm not worthy. And God will forgive us. The one who forgave the prodigal son. The one who constantly brings God's children back to his house. Or this calling upon us. Be reconciled to God. Find your spot in the church. Find your spot in the fellowship of those who love God. Enjoy it as one of them. Don't be like the older brother. Who abhors those who are celebrating goodness, joy, and godliness. Be reconciled to God. Serve God. Give praise to a living and loving God. Always be mindful of the three areas where the devil is. We are prone to the devil's prompts. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Be reconciled to God. Shun all those aspects. Walk with God in faithfulness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.